this section is yes. with yeah. yeah. David Yamani. We need to put a library for sparse random graphs. Alright, uh, thanks to the organizers, uh, in particular for our invitation. I have to begin with a disclaimer. This is really not a talk on statistical value theory. It's, uh, uh, although some uh, topics and issues, some combinatorial problems that I'm, I'm interested in and care about do come up uh, in the statistical learning theory, but they talk about something else. Perhaps the only connection is that this talk will be the biggest out statistical outlier of the entire problem. But other than that, it's about something else. And it's a joint work with the Mardus Sudan from uh, Microsoft Research. So the topic, uh, the context is how to solve combinatorial optimization problem on graphs. Um, and uh, so we have to think about some kind of a large graphs, sparse, meaning that nodes typically have very few connections, the degrees are small. And uh, you have some kind of optimization problem on this graph. And one particular optimization problem that I have in mind is a very, very canonical, classical optimization problem called the maximal independent set problem. The maximal independent set problem, also called sometimes hardcore problem or hard steer problem, is the problem of finding the largest in cardinality collection of nodes in a graph such that no two nodes are connected by an edge. So here's an example of, of, of some independent sets. So we have some nodes here. And dark blue nodes are not connected by an edge. This is not the largest independent set. It's a independent set. Uh, and our uh, and the goal is to find large such. Uh, and of course, that's a, it's a well-known hard optimization problem. It's going to be hard, so it's not really a question of finding the largest one, but trying to design an algorithm which will find something reasonably, reasonably large uh, independent uh, set. You can cast the problem, you can uh, formulate this problem as a special case of uh, exponential family distribution, some ground state of exponential family distribution. If you want to make a connection with the graph theory of graphical models and Markov random fields, that can be done. But I won't bother you with these details because it's sort of besides the point. Uh, what is a local algorithm? Uh, loosely speaking, uh, a local algorithm is an algorithm where for certain class of optimization problems, like largest independent set problem, where the decisions are made locally. What it means is that for every node explores its some small neighborhood around itself and makes a decision based on what it sees. Um, perhaps with some uh, augmentation of randomization. So every node will look around its neighborhood. And I want you to think about constant size neighborhood. So I look only sort of I explore my friends and friends of my friends and, and so on and so forth, maybe for depth 10. Whereas the graph itself goes to infinity. And I look at that and maybe I flip some points and make a decision. And I want to study the power of such algorithms. What kind of the best algorithms I can produce uh, using that framework. That might seem a little bit uh, unnatural or clear, so let me give you some context why such algorithms are natural. First, from the practical point of view, uh, sometimes local algorithms is the only thing you can use in practice if your data set, set data instance is huge. Uh, if you have a huge instance, and uh, even if you have polynomial time algorithm for whatever problem you're trying to solve, if it's, let's say, quadratic running time, and your size instance is terabytes, that's not a very powerful uh, algorithm. It will, it will, uh, it's not practical. Whereas local algorithms really, uh, really <coughs> require constant time. If you if you uh, if you're if you choose a neighborhood of the constant size, then your running time will be constant. Of course, you're running it in parallel. That's a different issue. But at least the running time is regional. So it makes sense from a practical perspective to look at something like this. And in fact, uh, for example, in, ele in electrical engineering statistics community, you might have come across something called message passing or belief propagation algorithm. 
that's a, some kind of a message passing scheme for finding uh, ground states of graphical models or finding some marginal probabilities in some uh, graphical probability distributions. Uh, if you run the belief propagation algorithm for constantly many rounds, that will be actually a special case of a local algorithm. Uh, might not be obvious now, but it, it, it is. Uh, perhaps the earliest uh, interest in, in, in the local algorithm comes from theoretical computer science under the framework of distributed algorithm, where you have many parallel processes and they are doing some kind of a computation and exchange messages, etc. And it turns out that there is a there's a formal definition of a local algorithm. It's very common using Turing machines, etc., all the appropriate uh, sort of uh, toolkit of theoretical computer science. But the definition is very complicated, and that's not the definition I will use here. And instead, I will rely on something that came out very recently, more in this mass combinatorics community, in the works of uh, Lovatz and many co-authors, um, which it, which comes in the context of uh, Bizarrely, perhaps, in the context, completely different non-algorithmic context, context of so-called graph limit theory. And uh, I, unfortunately, I won't. I don't have time to do the justice to this connection. So, offline, if you're interested, I can explain why the local algorithms come up as interesting object in the context of graph uh, limit theory. But nevertheless, they came up with a certain their own definition of local algorithm. And it's a particular framework for local algorithm, and that's the one I want to introduce now and discuss its power and limitation. So now let me become more concrete and introduce a particular definition of a local algorithm. Uh, for that purpose, we have to restrict the class of graphs that I'm interested in. So I'll slow down here and go step by step carefully so that you can follow. Uh, I'm now, from this point on, I'm only interested in so-called random endnote deregular graphs. What are those? First of all, a graph is deregular if every node has precisely d neighbors. Okay, that's the same. And I want you to think about d as constant, three, four, something not growing to infinity. Uh, and if the gra a graph is endnote, what, it, what is a random endnote deregular graph? You think you simply think of the class of all such graphs on n nodes, where every node has degree d, d regular graphs, and choose one uniformly at random from this exponentially large collection. Right? Um, choose such a random graph. You think of it as a sort of a typical kind of a graph from the family. Uh, one question is that how do you actually generate such graphs, and how do you reason about that? Th there are simple answers for that. There's something called the configuration model. And there's an efficient procedure for generating such graphs, but that's sort of besides the point. Okay? Um, so we randomly ge generate regular graph, uh, and it turns out that this graph has a very specific structure. Uh, in particular, if you, uh, if you pick a node uh, uniformly at random and explore its constant size neighborhood, it's constant that any constant, fix the constant, but let the size of the graph go to infinity, what you will discover is just a regular tree. You will not see short loops. It will, it will look like a regular tree. If you explore it deeper and deeper, eventually you'll see long loops. But there's no short loops in this graph. It looks like a tree. And it's regular because every node has the same number of connections. It looks like a calendar or something. That's what it's called. So that's a problem with this graph. And what's the implication? Yes? Do we even, do we do you know what the shortest loop in the, in the shortest cycle in such a graph? Yes, it's uh, log n. Log. Log n? Log n. Okay. The, was, was there a question? Or no, no, I just said log n. Okay. Consistency. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's log n. Um, so, um, all right. So that kind of makes it interesting because now every node sees precisely the same neighborhood. Right? And in, if you want to come up with some kind of a local algorithm with, to produce some interesting solution, uh, you really, the na neighborhoods are indistinguishable. They will all look the same. So your only hope to produce something clever is some kind of a clever randomization, some kind of a tie-breaking rule by saying that even though you and I see the same neighborhood, I will be in the independent set and you will be out, or vice versa. Right? So that's an interesting test. In, in general, random graph is an interesting test for uh, for heuristical algorithm. Uh, 
uh, mind you, the problem is in the, is in the heart. So we don't have a hope of constructing polynomial time algorithm. But who says that you cannot construct a fast, perhaps even local algorithm that works well on average instances? So it makes sense to look at average instances and try to come up with something nice. So in the context of these graphs, uh, 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 the... Wait, so isn't there a global algorithm, which is, you know, pretty close to optimal in this context? I mean, if you greedily choose the maximum, you know, I'll get to the that. independent set, that will be optimal, right? No, uh, there's uh, the best, no, I'll actually get to that, and that okay. goes to the heart of the problem. But jumping ahead, the best algorithm is a factor half uh, smaller than the optimal value. Uh -huh. There's a gap. Okay. In sparse that. graphs. In dense graphs, that's a different issue. Sparse graphs, that's the situation. I'll get to that, because that's actually crucial to the uh, so, all right, so uh, then Lobots and, 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 and co-authors have introduced uh, a particular framework for local algorithms, which they're called an IID factors. Uh, basically what it is, is some kind of a randomized procedure for tie breaking, some kind of a randomized rule for saying who's going to be in, who's going to be out. And it works roughly like that. So as I said, every node sees the same name. It says, sees this kind of a regular tree. So, uh, and this tree I denote by T, D, R. D is the, uh, is the degree. Every node has exactly the same number of neighborhood. I cheated. I should have an extra edge here. So D is four here. So I, so I'm drawing this picture by backwards. I missed one, one more. So in this case, D is four. Every node, except this error, has four neighbors. And what it sees is just a, just a tree. So IAD factors work roughly like this. Generate uniform random uh, IID values uh, and attach them to uh, nodes. So every node generates independently uniformly uh, uniformly at random chosen value. Uh, and uh, you think of this value as some kind of a, uh, as some kind of a randomization rule C. Some kind of a, a, a simulation C, if you wish. Uh, and suppose you have some kind of a function, an arbitrary function, which maps that weighted tree, weight this weighted by this uh, little uh, weights, random weights, into a decision zero or one. Right? And any such a function will, uh, any such function is some kind of a, a rule that you apply to your node. And then the local algorithm basically works like this. So you fix, you fix the depth r, you fix such a function f. It acts on weighted tree, so you have this tree, and it's weighted by this uniformly ch chosen uh, values, and produces a decision. Now, you can apply this function on your entire graph. How you do that? So if you go back to the graph, every node now generates a, a value uniformly at random. Then every node, in particular this node, looks at its tree. Now this tree is weighted, applies this function, and comes up with a value. And the value is either 0 or 1. So anything that you produce by this mechanism is called an IID factor. That's a crucial definition. I will, I'll, perhaps I will pause here and, and ask if you have any questions how that works. Yes? yes but this is, uh, where's the output? I mean, it still has to uh, satisfy the two nearby nodes. Uh, right. So I didn't say that. Uh, well, the out, somehow the function f should be clever enough that it produces an independent set, at least, right? So somehow it should be such that two, no two nodes produce this value 1 if simultaneously, joint, yeah. if they are connected by an edge. So that should be some kind of a built-in in the property of this function f. Um, other questions? Or? So you, you yeah. produce uh, the weight once for the entire graph, right? Yes. We don't produce it every time for every tree. Not an iterative yes. procedure. It's not an iterative procedure. One shot. Yeah, and actually that's a, that's a, that's a good comment because if, if you do it iteratively, it introduces some interesting challenges. Which Could is, it be? It doesn't sound like it's possible to do it iteratively. Uh, Why not? Message well, passing is iterative. No, yeah, message passing like is that. iteratively, but if you do it simultaneously, well, it's iterative in the sense that you send messages, then you stop, and every node simultaneously produces a decision based on messages that it uh, uh, learned after a certain number of iterations. 
that would be a, that would be a special case uh, of this. But one, but I think that that, that perhaps uh, the way I understood your comment is that you could pick a node, produce some decision locally, then remove this node, for example, have a smaller graph and repeat it. That sequential procedure won't be a part of won't be a part of this picture. And that's actually distinction is actually important for certain open questions that I have uh, in mind. Okay, so uh, if there's no more questions, then uh, I'll I'll continue. So uh, you, then you can think of this function f as some kind of an encoding of a local algorithm. Of course, it has to be computable, but let's not uh, worry about that. Let's say that's not an issue. And it produces some kind of output. The output, at the very least, it's a, the output of such a procedure is a bunch of zeros and ones on your graph. Okay. Uh, so the following conjecture was proposed by uh, Hatami Lowe and, and Zegedi. Uh, and also in some form and shape uh, was pre uh, also proposed by Aldous and Steele. It's not precisely that, but it's very closely related. They have conjectured that there exists some sequence of functions f dr which produce asymptotically largest independent set on random regular graphs. So they're, they're, not, they're not even conjecturing what is this, uh, what is this function. But they're just saying that there should exist something that when you apply this function locally and do this procedure, you'll get a symptotically largest independent set. And that's the formal statement of this conjecture. So on the right hand side, let me start from the right hand side. I n star is the size of the uh, largest independent set. That's the largest you can get, normalized by n. So it's natural normalization. Comment here. Uh, and uh, it is not too hard to see that the largest independent set in this graph will be order n. If you have n node graph and degree d, it's easy to produce by greedy procedure an independent set at least n over d, d plus one, yeah. d plus one by greedy procedure. Right? So the scaling here is n. That's 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 the right scale. You normalize by n, and the conjecture is that. There should exist a sequence of such local rules that will eventually, as you increase the size of the neighborhood, will actually produce something close to a largest independent set. And that has the double limit. First, you fix a rule, you seize the size, limiting size of the independent set produced by this rule, and then you apply this uh, rule for a larger, larger neighborhood, and hopefully you'll get, get to the limit. The quantity of the right hand side is now. No, it's not known, and that's uh, and I'll hopefully I'll make a comment uh, on that. Are bounds on it known? I mean, how far is it off from n over d plus one? A couple of slides. Okay, I'll get I'll get I'll, I'll get there, and I'll comment on it on on, on it. In, They're known in some special cases, but in the few special cases, but I, I don't want to digress too much. But there's one bound that will be directly relevant to that. So. What is the origin and sort of what's the idea of this conjecture? Well, uh, first time you see something like this, you might be puzzled. Why, 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 why is that even reasonable? Well, if you work with the belief propagation type algorithm, you would say, hmm, maybe that's actually, it has been tried in random instances, and that's actually perhaps a reasonable procedure. So that's actually, and it's a special case of a local rule, so maybe it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually a reasonable conjecture. Turns out that this conjecture is true for a different combinatorial optimization problem, maximal matching. Maximal matching, as most of you know, is the problem of finding the largest collection of edges which don't have uh, joint nodes. So that's a classical problem, not NP hard, it's a polynomial time solvable, but it's sort of besides the point. Turns out that you can actually solve it by means of local, local rules, and that has been done uh, fairly recently. Uh, all right, so uh, now let me in, in fact comment on what, what is the, the limiting <coughs> value, what do we know, what can be achieved by best algorithm, etc. Let, let me give you a little bit of a background of largest independent set in the random regular graphs. Turns out that even, it, it, it wasn't even obvious that such a limit exists. If you take the largest independent set and normalize by n, the fact that this quantity has a limit as n goes to infinity uh, is actually turned out to be 
uh, not obvious. It was posed as one of the open problems by David Eldis and uh, with Moxon Bayati and Fasat Itali, a few years ago, we, we, we proved the existence of this limit with hyperbability. Uh, you have hyperbability statement here because you're dealing with random graphs. So that's, that's, a, that's the only meaningful way you can uh, post it. So, Unfortunately, the proof technique is non-constructive and it's based on some super additivity property. So hence, we, we know the limit exists, but we don't know the value. You can get some bounds, uh, some, uh, but perhaps the most, the most relevant bound is asymptotic bound, but it's asymptotic in D. Uh, and much earlier, in 1992, Fries and Vuchak uh, proved that if you, look at this, if you look at this quantity, even though back then the quantity didn't, was not known to be existing, but you can look at the Lin Soup version of this quantity. It's not really that crucial, but the, the independence ratio, the ratio of the largest independence set by the size of the graph, as you increase the degree of the graph now, looks roughly like twice log d over d. And then there's a second order correction, uh, but I want you to focus on this quantity. So, we, while we don't know what this quantity is for fixed d, d is 3, 4, 5, we know that as d goes to infinity, it will behave roughly like this. Okay, so that's, that's uh, asymptotic, what's known as asymptotic. Any questions? Okay. Now let me switch to algorithms. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, the uh, best uh, algorithm the best that we that known algorithm can produce is only half of that quantity, uh, and, and so there is an algorithm that produces only something which is a synthetic logarithm of d divided by d versus twice log d over d, which is the right answer. Uh, and embarrassingly, that algorithm is actually very trivial. It's the most naive, greedy algorithm for producing independent set. You pick a node, you put it in independent set. You delete all the neighbors and repeat. Pick node randomly, delete neighbors and repeat. You hardly do any work. You don't even need to be clever by choosing nodes with the smallest degree, anything like that. You just do the, the most naive version and will produce something like this. And many, many attempts to do something better than that and get something qualitatively better fail. And this, this is still the best bound uh, on the largest independent set that you can produce on uh, a random instance. So that's that's the that's the state state of the art. Um, okay. Uh, incidentally, and uh, here's maybe some small connection with with, with the uh, works in statistics. This the nature of this problem, the hardness of this problem, is very similar to the hardness of something else called hidden click problem, which does come up in, in statistics and <coughs> a recent work by Philip and Bazet. They use it as a hardness gadget for some principal component analysis in lower rank approximation in, in statistics. Uh, and it's slightly different problem, hidden click problem is slightly different, but the nature of this problem and the challenges are of the same nature. Okay. So the uh, main result of this work is that this conjecture is not true. And in fact, uh, any such local rule will produce an independent set which is by certain factor smaller than, than the optimal. And the factor that we managed to show was is half plus something smaller than half. So any rule you use will be actually produce something strictly smaller than the optimal. And that's it. But this is even worse than the greedy approach. Uh, no, uh, because the greedy will only get you half. And this is this is... Uh, oh, that's not the dividing factor, that's... The yes, 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 sorry. Okay. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so this is uh, slightly better than uh, the greedy. Slightly better than the greedy, but it's a negative result. But, and in fact, you know, let me actually jump to the... There is a recent work, which is post our work, which and it's not published yet, so hopefully the paper will appear shortly. In fact, they do it all the way, they proved it all the way down to the greedy, so that matches now with what's what's not. So, and in fact, this 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 square of two is actually an artifact of the proof. And I'll tell you where it comes from. Uh, and we never believe that this is the right answer. Half is the right answer, and it seems like this was reached. So, up to half, greedy algorithm produces the best naive algorithm, and after that, any local rule fails. 
and it's not even ruled out that after one half, its problem is NP hard on average. But that would be that's uh, that question is out of reach at least. But for local algorithm, that's actually true. So so now let me actually uh, try to tell you where this half is coming. Is it your proof that's based on statistical uh, physics, or I'm sorry? Is it whose proof is based on statistical physics? Uh, on spin paths. Yes, yes, it's it's no, ours. Yes. Yours, okay. Yes, and and I'll I'll, I'll explain uh, huh. what it is. How about the other one that goes down to one half? They use a very similar but slightly more no slightly clever, <laughs> more clever procedure, but they use but the proof proof idea is is, is similar and use it both proofs use something called the shattering phenomena which is a very simple thing to explain, but the origin of this, to do the justice to the, to the seed idea of, of, of this proof, uh, is, is indeed the spin glass theory, and in, in, in fact, uh, uh, in particular, something called the shattering property. The shattering property first was predicted and, and proved rigorously uh, by Talagrand, predicted by physicists Nazar and Parisi, in the context of something called sherrington kirkpatrick uh, uh, spin glass uh, model, uh, but then it sort of slowly percolated to more combinatorial problem, and now let me just jump to the gun and tell you what, ex what exactly what it means in the context of independent set. And it's a very simple thing. So we, we don't need to bother, uh, it's, you don't need to be a statistical physicist to understand what's going on. It's a very simple geometric picture. The formal statement is here, but I'll tell you just qualitatively what, what, uh, what it is. Just to remind you, uh, I'm not sure, I'm Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll explain this picture and then hopefully and that, that will be probably the end of the talk. Um, to remind you, uh, 2 log d over d is the largest independence ratio. Asymptotically in large d, but that's, that's, that's okay, so that's, uh, that's what we want to get. The largest independent set that sh uh, greedy algorithm or any known algorithm produces is a half of that. Okay? Uh, so that region in between is the holy grail. This is where we want to get, and no one, no one knows how to get here. Well, it turns out that that actually threshold, that uh, log d over t, is, uh, is the phase transition property where something interesting goes on. Uh, what goes on here is the solution space uh, it changes its geometry completely from one something which is de so depicted here as a connected ball to something else which is collection of, of, of non-connected clusters. So let me, let me explain what, what the meaning of these uh, clusters. And that's the response to this notion of shattering. So fix any particular size of the independent set which is somewhere in between. So I parameterize it by beta, where beta is between 0 and 1. 1 plus beta log d over d. I would like to be able to produce independent sets of that size. That's, that's what I want to do. Look at the space of all independent sets of that size. It turns out that first, there's exponentially many such sets. So that's a theorem, so you can do it. There's exponentially many such independent sets. And they have a property. The property is that every two such independent sets either have a very significant intersection or they have a very small intersection and nothing in between. Okay? So, uh, So it turns out that there is, if you took, take two such independent sets, either they look something like this, or they look something like this. But they can never look something like this. You can specify the percentage of intersection and actually prove that no two independent sets will have this intermediate overlap. The implication of that is that you can partition your independent sets into clusters, into groups, defined by this proximity, such that independent sets with significant overlap are in the same cluster, independent sets with a small intersection are in a different cluster. And in, in other words, you, you've clustered independent sets and they are separated by a certain distance. That's a geometric property of independent sets uh, and it's a very, it's a, it's a deep property that was, as I said, first discovered by, for some other models, Shannon and Patrick, then something else called the random satisfiability, Boolean constraint satisfaction problem and others, coloring, and so on, and then finally for independent sets. Uh, but perhaps surprisingly, proving that deep result is actually very non, it's not complicated at all. All you have to do, well, all you have, uh, all you have to do is compute 
it, it turns out that it's not too difficult to compute the expected number of pairs of independent set of a particular size and particular intersection size. Uh, now, if you it, it's uh, if you've taken the, any class of random graph theory, you 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 will see that that's the case. Computing expected value of certain quantities is a trivial exercise. It's just uh, you write down as as indicator functions and compute the probability that you have this intersection in a particular location, and that's simple. And then and then you do that, and it turns out, and as typical in in this business and in general, you have a competition of exponents. You have exponential explosion of the number of pairs. At the same time, you have exponentially unlikelihood that you have that uh, occurrence in a particular location. You, and you do this comparing of exponents, and it turns out that for particular intersection size, the negative exponent kills the positive exponent, and therefore there's nothing, uh, nothing there. So conceptually, it's a very simple proof. Uh, and the outcome of this proof is that, uh, is that the solution space clusters. Um, and that fact that was first established by Koja uh, Oblan and Timu for Erdos Reni graph, and then we proved it for uh, random regular uh, graphs. There was more work for random regular graphs, but it's just a technical, not conceptual. It's the same idea. Allows uh, us to prove uh, that result. I'll skip the slide uh, uh, here. And the idea of the uh, of the proof of the negative result is rather simple. It's based on the idea, okay, if there was a local algorithm that could produce independent set with size sitting in that region, then we could use this algorithm twice in some <coughs> coupled way, in some clever coupled way, to produce two independent sets which have the region of that size. But we know such a thing is impossible, and therefore hence the contradiction. Uh, and the details of these couplings are not, well, I, I don't have time to do that, but uh, the details of this company are not too complicated. You simply start by running to the, uh, running this algorithm first two times independently and producing two independent sets which are completely based on completely independent sources of seeds. In that case, their intersection turns out to be very, very small. And then you s slowly interpolate between these two completely independent choices and sort of start gradually bringing the two sets uh, together. And you can show that that procedure is continuous in the interpolation parameter. And at some point, you will hit the region that's uh, here, which you have simply know not to exist. But once you know this, this picture is uh, there of the clustering, how to build such a con uh, contradiction argument is not, uh, is not too complicated. So, and there are here some details of that. But in the interest of time, I'll skip that. Um, and uh, we were trying to sort of push that uh, a little bit further. And one perhaps interesting direction is indeed try to use that for algorithms uh, which are local but sequential, going back to the comment that was made earlier. Suppose now you apply local rules but sequentially. Pick a node, do something locally, reduce the graph, and do it again. In that case, you cannot formally cast it. As, a, as, a, as IAD factors, because IAD factors assume that all nodes make a decision simultaneously based on neighborhood. But if that, if, if that bridge can be gapped, that would be nice, because in the existing literature on using BB propagation and more elevated version of that called something called survey propagation algorithm is actually be, uh, proposed and tested in real instances by doing it sequentially as opposed to as opposed to simultaneously. So to show some negative results for that uh, framework of algorithm, we would need to do it, uh, apply it for sequential uh, selection. And uh, it's also, in, in a different uh, uh, form, it's related to something else that David Ellis calls uh, called the invariant processes, but it's really a version of uh, uh, IAD factors. And that the problem he pr uh, proposed is related to the actual maximal cut uh, uh, problem. But in the interest of time, I'll push this off offline. That's the end of my I, I would suggest that we ask the questions locally. All right. So <laughs> if you don't mind, so we can now extend the last speaker. Oh. 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 Oh.